these really are turbulent times, too. And tracing the, the problem down, I'm going to ask you what's on your mind. What are, what are the, 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 uh, the things that you'd like to solve with your board or with other boards that you've observed? Uh, the rogue trustee was, was mentioned as one possibility, so I'll put that in just to prime the pump. But what else is on your mind? What are the, what are the things that are, are bothering you? Let, as you think about that a minute, let me tell you, I've got a friend whose name is John, <clears throat> and John, about a year ago, got a parrot for a gift from his wife. It was kind of a gag gift, and, uh, but he took kindly to this parrot. Thought he, what, he, what his wife didn't know is that he's always wanted to have a bird in the house, and he always thought maybe he could t teach a parrot how to speak. The only problem was this parrot had uh, previously lived for a couple of years on a, on a ship, on a, a ship with a with a sailor, and his language was a little on the salty side, shall we say, uh, and people would come into the house and the parrot would start to abuse these guests in the house and call them names and specialize in four-letter words. <laughs> uh, John, John worked and worked and worked on this parrot to see if he could get him to shape up, and one day he kind of lost it and he started to, he grabbed the parrot and started to shake him around, and the more he shook the parrot, the more abusive the parrot got, so finally John walked over, uh, and opened the door to his freezer, his upright freezer, and just threw the bird in and slammed the door. And there was all this squawking and banging around in the freezer, and then after a couple of minutes, there was just nothing at all, just complete silence. And John thought, oh my God, what have I done with the parrot? I probably killed the parrot. So he went over to the freezer and he opened the door, and out came the parrot. He was shaking and shivering, <clears throat> and he said <clears throat> to John, I'm sorry, John, for misbehaving in your house for as long as I have. <laughs> I promise from this point forward to conduct myself with a great deal of deportment, and I promise again never to embarrass you in front of your friends or your family. And by the way, John, I have one question. What did the turkey do? <laughs> I, I, I made that up, but I like the joke. <laughs> uh, so so we're, we're here looking for turkeys right now. What are, what are some of the, uh, the problems that boards face, what are the challenges? What's on your mind? What would you like to know in terms of, of, uh, of, of, of issues or, or, or skills that might need uh, maybe some fleshing out or some explanation or some discussion? The, where, where I'm going is this. If, if, this, if the, uh, the, the, these big ideas, which are great, by the way, are going to work. They're going to need not only the leadership of the presidents, which we've got, right? All 19 have signed on, right? That's what I heard. They're also going to need the backing of the board. Um, as, as the president said, right? They, they're going to have to stay connected. So uh, what's it going to take to stay connected? We've had the first presentation about the big ideas and the presidential leadership. Now we're having the meta discussion. In Greek, meta means after, so, but, but in some ways before. In order for this to work, right, you tell me if I'm wrong about this, this has got to work, be working too, right? The boards have to be plugged in, right? Okay, that's what I thought I heard uh, Dr. Crable say. So uh, what, what, what are the issues that are going to come up when the trustees are called upon to, uh, and I'm going to write them down here on, on, on these pads. Uh, what, 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 what problems might uh, ensue if, if this, great uh, ideas project is rolled out for the full public view and implementation. When will the trustees be, be tested and how will they be tested? What do you think? Um, this is an open discussion. I'm just looking for ideas from anybody at this point. Yes? The public will ask them how much will it cost? How much does it cost? What's the cost? And if it costs less, that'll be easy to explain. What if it happens to cost more? Especially in this new economic reality, as uh, uh, freeholder Christopher told us we're facing. And I think he's right. It is, a, as Laurie said, like a light went on in a dark room and we see things as we've never seen them before. Uh, Dean Dad in Inside Higher Education described this a couple of weeks ago as permanent austerity. You know, we thought this was just a dip. Now we think it may be where we're going to have to live for a long time. So uh, if, if it's going to cost more and we need more, and at the same time the legislature cannot or will not give us more, 
uh, you know, we got a crunch, we got an issue. So that's that's a problem. Yes. It could be that in order to um, um, make some of the changes, there may be uh, services or programs that have to go at the community college level, which could cause problems uh, in terms of the trade-off. Okay. Uh, what what passengers do we throw overboard? To stay with my nautical theme today, I don't know why I got on that. I hate sailing. Uh, but that's right. Um, uh, effective organizations recognize that if they have fewer resources, they, then they must discontinue something or else everything gets devalued, right? Uh, you, you have to, if you have, have a problem of reduced capacity because of reduced support, um, for a while you try to do more and more with less and less, but when you get close to the, uh, what did you say, <laughs> doctor? Nothing, with, for, yeah, nothing. nothing for nothing, basically. Yeah, you, get, you get no support at all and you can't produce much with it either. Yeah, that's because you didn't discontinue certain programs. What goes overboard and how do you explain a discontinued program? Yeah, that's good. Yes? Okay, how are we doing? Compared. So the question is, what do we do to get trustees ready to answer these questions? Why is it costing more? Why did we discontinue, or why did you discontinue my favorite program, and uh, what, wh how do you know we're doing well compared to your uh, peers? What do you know about your peers and how successful they are? Yes. I was going to add to what Harry said. You know, what 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 skills do we need to survive difficult conversations about a comfortable data? Keep, give me a little bit more on that. If we're going to talk about student success. There's two sides to that. Keep going. So, um, what skills do presidents and trustees need to build together? Ah. Okay. To enhance the ability to have very candid conversations about things that are tough. Ah, very good. Okay. What communication skills do we need as academic leaders? I heard a presentation by the uh, folks in Indiana at the Servant Leadership Center on that just uh, about two weeks ago. And they said, in the old model, it was, um, I'm in charge here, shut up and sit down. Right? That, that was the way you answered a, uh, a challenge. <laughs> it doesn't work anymore. Right? It doesn't work very well. You need, you need to uh, make sure that you get across to the challenger that you've heard the challenge and that you understand the challenge and that you empathize with them for their feeling of loss over the program that's been discontinued and all of that. Uh, but were we all born with Bill Clinton communication skills? I don't think so. Uh, I, I, my, my wife kids me because we like to take uh, tests in Cosmopolitan magazine and one time there was one on empathy and I didn't even hit the bottom of the chart. You know, I was below the bottom of the chart, uh, which is theoretically impossible. But she said, if you know Gary very well, you'll understand. He has no empathy at all. And that's been a hard thing for me in communication. And maybe one of the reasons that I never became a college president. I, people would come to me with a dumbass idea, and I would say, that's a dumbass idea. <laughs> <laughs> you you, you got to throttle that back sometimes when you're the president. Yeah. Yes? I was uh, just to even be more specific in that, if, if we focus on student success, in terms of uh, the number of kids who sign up and who are there on the first day. Right. And then how many are there on the last day of the course. Right. And then what grades do they get? If we start focusing on that kind of model for student success, we're going to have to uh, learn how to talk and support our president. I can, uh, that's changing the notion from teaching to learning. OK. And it uh, seems to me that would be a radical change just for some people. Okay, so metrics can drive learning and put the emphasis on learning instead of teaching. So the question is not how many people do we have enrolled, uh, but how many people have learned something that's going to get them farther along in life, right? 
And the question is, uh, what metric is there for that? How do we talk about that when people are so used to measuring it in the old fashioned, simplistic way of what's your enrollment this semester? Sure, that's, that's gonna be difficult. And it's gonna be difficult for the faculty to understand too. Aren't we sort of going on their turf when we do this? I mean, we are telling the faculty what is important for people to know. Boy, that, I'm an old faculty member, and that'll start a fight most any time, especially amongst liberal arts faculty. You can get historians tearing each other to shreds just over what's important to know in history. I mean, the historians tear each other up, much less fighting with other disciplines or with the college president, right? So yeah, well, the value of knowledge and what should be valued and what should not be valued. All kinds of uh, uh, pot shots on college faculties about the bean counters running things, right? So the, the more you do metrics, the more you're a bean counter and have to answer for that. How are, you gonna, how are you gonna answer that? If somebody says, why should we let the bean counters make all the decisions? Yeah, the trustees better have, have thought that one through in the simulator before they actually fly the plane because the day will come when they're flying the plane, the challenges are gonna come at a board meeting, and the board either has to respond that night or in some future meeting as to why they've made the decision based on metrics. Why are all of a sudden metrics so important? Okay, what else? Anything else? Yes? You used the word earlier on, you used the word meta. Yes. And uh, you know, another meaning of that is overarching. Mm -hmm. And I think, it, I think that's a, a good word to use in this discussion as well, because I think one of the mistakes we can make today is if we focus uh, exclusively on our problems. Because I, I, th I think what we're really dealing with is a cultural shift here. And uh, the nature of the business we're in is, is totally different. It will never be the same again. So I, I think not only we have to deal with these issues, but I think we need to be able to forecast accurately the nature of the business we'll be dealing with and the nature of the students. This is an entirely different student we're dealing with and it, it will never be the same again. Yeah. So I mean this is a, my dad was a commercial artist and you know he started the profession in the 1930s and you know he learned uh, by drawing at the board and by the time he retired it was all, it was all computer graphics and, and now it's totally different from it was when my dad retired. And yeah. that's really kind of a metaphor for what we're in now. I mean, we're, we're, you know, we, we, most of us started this profession as draftsmen at the drawing board. And it's just not that way and it never will be again. Yeah. You think it's permanent? Absolutely. Not just a dip, not just a temporary. I'm not saying say it's a dip. I think it's, it's different. It's just it's not okay. going to be the same. I do, I do too. But every time I say that, I get an argument from an historian who says, you know, the university didn't change for 2,000 years. Plato's Academy was pretty much the same as the University of Chicago 1,900 years later. Actually, it would have been more like 2,400 years later. But uh, I think you're right. Well, I think one, of the, one of the issues we're dealing with Gary now too is I think a lot of our, our faculty and staff haven't figured this out yet. And it, it, it's not a matter of arguing with them whether it's right or wrong. It's, it's the reality. Of yeah, it. and you can't say shut up and sit down, can you? If they, only once. <laughs> only once, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and you better have your resignation letter in the drawer, yeah. Uh, back there. But I do think there is the opportunity just to go on that tip. You know, how do you get factual data to this population as well as to the faculty around what, what is the employer demand of the future? What is the what in the end? What is Demand. You know, part of this is regional economic development as well. So if we don't understand what the demand is and what the criteria for success are from the employer, then, you know, direct you be teaching all you want. Okay, so the, que the challenge there is how to explain the connection between uh, employment, uh, the connection uh, between uh, the academy, which is us, and uh, the employer, academy. Academy and employer, right? That's it. How do you do that? Uh, we're not trained to do that, right? None of us went to trustee school. Uh, we haven't graduated from trusteeship 301, how to explain the connection between the academy and the employer, but kind of we should have, right? That's something we have to learn. Isn't that what you're saying? Have to learn how to explain that in, 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 in Newsweek type language, right? Uh, we, have to, uh, we have to abandon jargon, all ye who enter here, right? Well, and there are many other states, too, that, like, for instance, there are models that, like WordPeace, which actually is utilized to figure out, gee, what we're producing, you 
you know, not to say not to minimize it, but yeah. the results of the education actually are going to meet the competency requirements in the future. So we have to stop using the word work keys, which is jargon, and let's think let's think of another Let's think of a, a common uh, term for it. What is work keys? Everybody knows what work keys is, right? Or some of you do. What would you call it if you didn't get to call it work keys? Competencies. Competencies, okay. What else? What are some other possibilities? Skill sets. How about stuff you got to know <laughs> to do, fill in the blank, right? To be a webmaster. Or to be, what are some of the emerging occupations? To be a, the, the, the campus the security officer drove me out here from the train station today. His daughter is going to start nursing school next year and she's going to be a nurse anesthetist. Anesthetist? Say it. Anesthetist? Okay. All I know is she's going to make $200,000 a year. Uh, and that's probably what she knows too. But what do you have to know in order to be a nurse anesthetist? Uh, that's, that's, that's the work keys thing. Uh, uh, our college is good at tracking that. And, and let me throw out a challenge to you all. Why do you care how many people graduate or how many people get a certificate? The question really is, certificate for what? And is there a job in that area? And does it pay enough to live on, right? So it isn't just, I mean, if we graduated 100% of our, of our students in my old field, philosophy, we'd be a success, right? President Obama would take his ball and go home and fight with somebody else because we'd be a, just an amazing success story. 100% graduates, we're all graduating with majors in philosophy. How many jobs are there in philosophy? We used to, in our, in our departmental bulletin when I taught at Missouri, we used to put right in the philosophy department bulletin at the very bottom, there are no jobs uh, advertised for philosophers. <laughs> Just so, so students knew and so that we were honest. Now, some students wanted to major in philosophy anyway, and then they went on to be great ministers or college presidents. You can do a zillion things. You can go to law school and outthink most of your class because you're a philosophy major. I don't want to put down my discipline. But uh, we, we need to know what, what's out there and how it matches up to what we're teaching, right? That, that's, that's what you're saying. Okay, all right, these are, these are good challenges. Yes? We also have to be more aware of the international the, the world today is so small, and there's jobs in Indonesia that we're maybe we don't even realize are, are there. Right. So we have to be more cognizant of, of other countries. Yeah, what do we need to know about the world and people in the world who are not in our country? other countries and the people who live in other countries. When I was taking a, uh, one of my first courses in Spanish, it was Spanish 101, uh, and I was taking it uh, mainly because I found a woman I thought I wanted to marry who was a Spanish teacher. So, you know, I was working an angle there. Uh, and she was in Illinois and I was up in Michigan, so I enrolled at Delta Community College in uh, Spanish 101. And uh, it was a fun course, and we were about halfway through the semester. And one day, one of my classmates came in. She was a young woman, about 20 years old, maybe. And she said, guess what happened today? And she worked for GM. And I said, what? And she said, I called our plant in uh, Barcelona, Spain. And I said, great. Uh, what about it? And she said, the woman answered in Spanish. <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, but, but, but Digame, uh, she had heard that probably a, a hundred times before, but she had no idea what it was, so she just ignored it and started talking in English. So, so the people in Spain uh, think of us as basically buffoons, right? They're, they're trilingual people who know three languages, bilingual, no two languages, and then they're Americans, right? No, no one language generally. And, 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 that, and that, that becomes a real hardship for a, a person in business, let's say, especially when he's trying to sell, right, in France. Somebody pointed out who was in business to me one time, you can always buy in English very easily. It's really hard to sell in English in another country, right? Because people aren't, aren't going to want to listen to you unless you know their language and their ways, right? Their ways. Uh, and, and some of this is hard stuff. When I worked for Jack Ryder, that president up in Michigan, he went over to China on a visit to some Chinese universities, and one of my jobs was to prepare gifts for him to give out in China. And I decided 
that what he should take are, were little clocks. We had little clocks that we gave visitors to the campus and we put them in little white boxes and wrapped them up with white wrapping paper and white ribbon. And when he came back, he said, um, the clocks weren't such a hit in China because uh, clocks are a symbol of death and you don't really hand out clocks kind of as a glad handing thing. And if you wrap them in white, it's double bad. It would have been bad, better if I'd wrapped them in black, but who would have known that, that white clocks are bad in China, except maybe somebody who studied Chinese, right, or the Chinese culture. So what do we need to know? And that wasn't even somebody who taught Chinese telling me this. This was a college president. He needed to know more about another country.